In another of my Living in the Past series of videos, and a collection in its own right, booting up here, we turn our attention to the blooming personal computer market, a monstrous industry kicked off by IBM back in the 80s and the compatible market it created, continuing past the home computer's demise in the 90s. Now, Once we hit the mid-90s, the advantage turned to consoles as that 3D revolution ushered in a brand new dawn. The might of a 486DX VGA display was lacking the grunt to keep up with the vector calculations, texture mapped polygons and detailed 3D models. But the modular design of PC has always been its biggest strength and its biggest weakness. Once the CPU hit the limit of what it could render, the next stage, and still by far the biggest now, came to its rescue. 3D graphics cards were not only the latest craze, they were a necessity if it wanted to keep up with the Joneses, the emerging console tech and the shift away from 2D. Plug and play it was far from, but the results were spectacular when it worked. Now, we need to remind ourselves of the core hardware and date here. With this kicking off a series of videos I've been working on for a while, looking back at the PC graphics accelerator market using real retro PC hardware, real games as they were, untouched, unemulated, and sometimes just plain unloadable. Comparing them against the competition, the hardware, and themselves, and even time itself. Well, the very first video here is the early days and the true market grabbing card from Nvidia that launched them into the front with their explosive TNT range. Here with a second card of that mainstream grabber in the TNT2 M64. This was the cutback 64 bit bandwidth rather than the full fat 128 bit that the bigger end card had, but this tended to only affect you when you cut back on the texture resolution depth, the screen depth from 32 to 16 bit. Now this was a card that competed with the Power VR, the ATI Rage, and the daddy of the day, the Voodoo 2 from 3DFX, arguably the best Voodoo of them all. Now at the heart of the VIA machine, another classic piece of hardware back in the day, is AMD's last conquering CPU of the Athlon XP, here in budget form of the Duron the connoisseur's choice of value CP back then. Now this actual machine is one I know well, as I built it for relatives back in 2000 as a home PC with light game use. This was a lucrative market in the late 90s for the end of this, and I nearly went full time I was so busy with it. I took it back from that owner a few years ago as it had been consigned to the loft. It gives us a good sample of just what the move from real DOS operating systems, software-based rendering, single digit memory was like, and it all started to leap into that GUI-based OS, hardware accelerated 3D, and hundreds of megabytes of RAM, and upwards of one gigabyte hard drives. The 2000s were a very productive time. A much faster and more explosive time than now, in fact. In the space of four years, the PC market went from behind the console space to the front, with some epic toing and froing along the way and just past, but this is all for videos yet to come. But what is it like to really be a PC gamer back then? Well, by 1996 or so, it had become much, much easier. But I have another video that covers the earlier Windows 3.1 time coming. Now, at this point, PC hardware was much simpler to build, buy, and upgrade. Drivers, operating systems, and choice had really expanded, but the ease, simplicity, and compatibility of modern plug-and-play PC as we enjoy it now was still quite a while away. Now, you have not lived a day as a PC gamer if you've not tussled with sound card choices longer than a phone book, IO ranges and IRQ conflicts, high mem sys files, CLI driven browsing and degaussing. Yeah, the satisfaction of a good degauss can never be under egged. Like a fine wine, it just gets better with age. Now, you see, back then the market was in flux and inundated with choice, hardware and software. A chip. A chip that could revolutionize medicine as we know it. By performing over a hundred billion operations a second. And give us all more time to cherish the journey's truest rewards.
But then we thought, hey, let's use it for games. <laughs> 3DFX PC accelerators. So powerful, it's kind of ridiculous. Leaving aside the satirical humour of the 90s and the much better quality of adverts, which I sadly miss, this also meant that multiple methods were used in this emerging market. Such companies as Silicon Graphics invented their OpenGL API, which was pushed out to PC for 2D and 3D rendering. And then Microsoft had to step up from a DOS-based video interrupt to the introduction of its GDI-enhanced Direct Draw. The biggest impact though came from 3D effects with its proprietary and totally excellent Glide API, exclusive to its range of cards. Now this only focused Microsoft and certainly teams were picking OpenGL and other formats. So to compete, a little piece of software called DirectX was born, which went head to head with these other competing APIs. The graphics card drivers were very different then as they are now, as was the hardware and the landscape as a whole. Now this uncertainty meant that in many games and software, your experience could vary more than a holiday flight with Ryanair. Now if you were lucky, the chosen game would install first time, follow the prompts and pop up. The majority though was checking specs, buying RAM, diving into hardware checks and setup screens, or even back into BIOS to turn functions on or off. I have lost weeks of my life in pre and post windows, long sessions just to get something on screen or out of the built in tower speaker. Ooh, that takes you back, doesn't it, eh? Now, you became good at checking your hardware settings, memorizing the DMA channels or interrupts, knowing that 32-bit depth may crash your system, and page swapping was a no-no for games, as demonstrated here by Max Payne. Now, I would not change it for the world, though, as it was exciting. No internet to lean on, just your own knowledge, patience, and luck meant once you got X-Wing fired up and the music blasted out of those tiny, tandy speakers, you felt you had earned a few hours of escapism through your rites of passage and tinny music. Now, I would buy some games knowing I had fun ahead of me that evening to figure out the requirements, I could beat those minimum specs or not. And what really made this amazing, though, was the individuals and the teams using the platform to push things on. From the likes of Doom, Descent, Tomb Raider, Quake, Monkey Island, Wing Commander, Unreal, Max Payne, Kingpin, and of course Half-Life to name but a few. It was a very explosive time for all things binary. Now, as is always the case, competition breeds innovation, and innovation breeds technology, and that was certainly true here, if ever. CPUs, GPUs, software-driven rendering, hardware-driven rendering, and combinations thereof. Now, this machine kind of straddled that point where PC graphics technology was moving up and getting closer to what was about to land with the PS2 and the Dreamcast. Arguably, you could get some cards nearer that time that were nearly as good, but they weren't as polished and there were options and issues along the way. We're not going to delve into that too much here, but concentrate mainly on that split between CPU-driven software renderers and hardware accelerated ones, and just how that is actually vastly different when you use that terminology as a catch-all. Take a game like Screamer here, which came out in 1996, based on Daytona Racer or Ridge Racer, that's really its style that it's aiming for. This title was one that really pushed the boat out in terms of PC, but it was completely driven by a software renderer. That means the CPU did all the work. That's how things used to work back then. Predominantly, that's how things worked on the 32-bit consoles as well. Both the Saturn and the PS1 heavily relied on their CPUs to generate all of their outputs, calculate the vertex calculations in the image 
images on screen. Now the biggest fundamental difference here though with the PS1 and the Saturn was the PS1 did have additional hardware to help with this calculation, the GTE, the Geometry Transform Engine. Now what this did was, it wasn't essentially a GPU, it was a secondary CPU or DSP, a calculation that helped for vector mathematic calculations for things like lights, geometry, polygons and certainly the coordinate transformation from a 3D world into a 2D one, that matrix calculation and that's why it was able to generate 3D worlds much better but fundamentally it was still a completely 2D driven game, no, no depth buffer, no understanding of depth at all on both consoles and this is predominantly why the Saturn had two CPUs because it tried to use that to basically mimic what the GTE was doing on the PS1. And it just simply wasn't as good because it wasn't dedicated to it. But fundamentally, they both suffered from the same issues. And that was a very limited understanding of depth in the image. Now, there was no hardware Z or depth buffer at all. Arguably, you could use a software solution, but they realistically just drew vertices from back to front over each other to give depth. And this is why you get Z fighting, clashing, clipping, and all those areas that are predominant and ever present across retro titles. And I've covered that in depth. And this also affected the PC equally. Although, with hardware like the TNT2, hardware Z buffer was added, just like the N64, one of its big steps forwards. And this solved this issue by actually having a dedicated buffer here in the TNT, a 24-bit buffer. And this created a depth index of where vertices would be within the depth of the back and the front of the screen. And this index allowed you to draw calculations and stop this, this clashing and this clipping of issues, which you can see quite clearly here in the software-driven version of the PC in the software renderer. As I'm trying to show you all the clipping issues now, everything's rotating around. Now, it would reduce this to almost being not present, but dependent on the complexity of the scene, you could still have this limit if you broke that 24-bit depth. That's why you have clashing, and these are issues you can see here on the PC version of games such as Tomb Raider, which does exactly the same thing. Lots of Z fighting, lots of clashing, all the issues that you saw on both the Saturn and the PS1, because it was a quasi-solution between hardware acceleration and software-driven rendering. And that combination limited some of the choices people could make, but it also limited the options in the games. Tomb Raider was a standout title, as we all know. One that kind of stands shoulder to shoulder with something as mighty as Super Mario 64. It was around the same time, developed in parallel and had no influence on that. And it found its own solution to solving a 3D world using vertex grids. And this was transferred across to the PC, which has a very decent port. Again, though, this is running on a much more powerful PC than what was available at the time. A 1.1 gigahertz Duron here is potentially, arguably, almost exactly the same as a 1 gigahertz Athlon XP. Hardly a poor CPU then, and certainly not even available back in 1996. So this isn't really a view of that, we'll come to that in another video. But you can see the shift from software to hardware-based rendering once we moved into Tomb Raider 3. Look at the edges of the wall and the brickwork as I run and it comes close to the screen. This is the reduction of vertices, triangles, which therefore was a quick win, especially on the Saturn where it subdivided these, kind of tessellated them as they got nearer to the screen to reduce that warping effect, that perspective correction, which is evident here on PC. Now it's still present on the high settings, but it increases the triangle count, therefore it subdivides like the Saturn did and improves that image quality. But here in Tomb Raider 3 in full hardware-based Z depth, it doesn't have any of these issues at all with Z fighting and warping because every vertices, every triangle, every UV map is all hardware calculated and given an index table. So therefore it reduces that warping and that shift because it actually understands the depth of the object it's wrapped around, the UV coordinates, and therefore the texture map is readjusted based on that view, that angle and the depth on screen. I'll cover this far more in my other video, but here is just a summary. Even though performance on both versions is quite poor and it can suffer equally on PC as it can on the PS1, it was a title that showed this balance between trying to refine something and trying to run it slightly better on much better hardware in the TNT2. It's obviously not an issue in modern technology nowadays, but it was ever present and a constant battle back then with software renderers and hardware came in as always and just became much better more efficient at doing the same job you can check out more on that in terms of texture mapping warping affine texture mapping which the ps1 used and that could be a very similar solution on the saturn over on my wipeout videos but aside the hardware-based Z-buffer though, what else came with these accelerators? 
Well, texture filtering, as the N64 had also introduced in 1996, was also present. Bilinear and trilinear was the default, enabling textures to blend and blur when close or stretched across vertices. Now, this was again a big shift at the time and not widely accepted as a positive. It really requires high resolutions and textures to support them, something the N64 lacked with a marginally larger texture cache than the PS1. But those raw texels can often look better, in my opinion, than the filtered ones on Nintendo's console and here on the 3D PC cards. Now, the biggest leap here, though, is in RAM. Having access to 64 megabytes of dedicated VRAM meant that screen resolutions and, more importantly, textures could be larger, as large as 2048 by 2048. A huge 64 times increase over the PS1's maximum of 256 by 256 texture pages. Now, the other boost comes from the leap in triangle throughput. The 360,000 maximum of the PS1, theoretical that is, is over half once textured and lit, meaning the TNT2 here can easily draw and texture many, many more, helped by its twin textual pixel pipeline. Now this made blended textures and such much better, and is actually where the TNT name is derived from, twin texel pipe times two, aka the TNT2. Now, not all was in the advanced PC hardware's favour, though. Unlike the PS1 with its GTE and the Saturn's DSP within the SCU, here on PC, even in early 1999, it still relied on software transform and lighting, TNL, to transform the vectors and triangles into a 2D image, correct them, clip them, and light these via the CPU as well. But the main purpose here was not really to add any additional benefits, it's actually to keep performance as high as possible and remove strain from the CPU. The general consensus was that CPUs were powerful enough to do this, and in a 1.1 GHz dual run here, it's still doing a great deal of the rendering even in hardware mode. Now, this is borne out by the frame rate comparison between the two modes, really only improving stability of frame rates over a pure software solution, even at 640 by 480. In comparison, the PS1 is still more performant, albeit at lower resolution, less triangles, more object warping, and it was, by now, approaching six years old. Many other games, though, show the improvement from the card, such as Half-Life, Max Payne, etc., but the biggest sacrifice was PC games could not widely adopt a hardware-based geometry solution as it was too fragmented across the range. Back to that strength and weakness again. But this is where Nvidia and AMD stole the market by pushing this into the GeForce and Radeon cards respectively, but that's a video for another day. And this is why fundamentally games on PC took a while to catch up to the quality and the technology on consoles, even though unquestionably the hardware was better. It wasn't really being used in the, the more efficient way that consoles were doing, but they soon caught up and the TNT2 did deliver much better experiences visual quality than the PS1 could and certainly the Saturn. Now, you compare these to the PS1, it's much better and more refined. If you ran this on a CPU back at the time, like I say, like a 486 or maybe a K62, then this would give you a much slower performing title and one that wouldn't run anywhere near the level we're seeing here. The PS1 really was ahead of its, its market at the time, as was the Saturn. Again, it's one of those references when you talk about old consoles. The Saturn was only poor because it went up against the PS1. Had it launched without the PS1, it would have been incredible. And that's kind of the argument. It always based on what's in the market at the time. That's how competition works. The PC market pushed beyond this, though, much, much quicker. You saw games like Max Payne, Half-Life, which kind of reinvented the, the wheel in 1998. And it still performs very well. Now, a title that had a half port over to the Dreamcast, arguably, I think, using the Microsoft CE environment to get that pushed out very quickly. And the performance, as you can see with brief examples on screen, even though it's fully V-synced and doesn't tear like it does on the PC version here, the TNT2, it does perform better and worse going between the two. So arguably, it washes its face in terms of performance, but the visual quality and the resolution is slightly better. And that's down to the fact that this wasn't really a high-end port. It was a rush port that never saw the light of day. It's been leaked since. And obviously there's huge areas of performance improvements. And I'm sure this would have come out performing much better than the TNT2 because the Power VR card inside the Dreamcast was far more powerful than what's possible on this particular machine at the time. And the SH4s, or the SH2s, I'm trying to remember which one they were now. SH4s, I think, on the Dreamcast. That was a 
Arguably a weaker CPU than what everyone expected, but it was a CPU that did the job. And this is what we've seen across the board. Some of these early titles back then, Screamer, like I say, stood out, but you ran it on a 486. It went from a completely un-V-Synced 40 to 50 FPS title, as you see here on a 1.1 gigahertz Duron, to a complete unplayable stuttering mess. And this is what you see on a lot of retro stuff with PC hardware. Running an emulator like DOSBox to run it on modern hardware gives you a completely false view of what these titles actually ran like, let alone how they worked, all the issues that went around them, because it's completely wrapped in an emulated state in a virtual machine effectively to keep everything running exactly as the developers intended in the perfect environment. And that's not what these videos are about. These videos are about showing you performance as it was then. And as you can see with some samples on the screen, it can be a very varied affair. Max, Max Payne was an absolutely astounding title from Remedy and really stood proud on the PC market and then slowly hit this, the console market and had a pretty good port, even if it wasn't as good as the high-end PC at the time. But you can see here with a 32 megabyte TNT2 and 128 megabytes of system RAM, you have to lower the texture details down to medium and you still get page swapping there in terms of the hard drive and the split pools of RAM from the system RAM and AGP RAM which helps feed the VRAM on the card. Mm -hmm. When you run this at high detail, you get incredibly bad performance, completely locking the entire game up for seconds on end uh, and that's unplayable, it's totally unplayable. This is really a 30 FPS title, just like it is on console. But here on PC, most games ran completely unlocked, or even with VSync turned off, like Half Life does. And that can make the games perform quite poor when you play them now. Again, in modern emulators, all these titles will be fully VSync because the emulated state and the VM takes care of all that and gives you a false view. And I hope this brief introduction to how these PCs worked, how the hardware was back then, and how we saw such leaps forward in games such as Quake here. Now, Quake was a title that didn't have a hardware-driven solution. It was completely software. And again, running it here, it's around the 30 FPS mark. Again, on this CPU at pretty high resolution. If you lower it down, you can get slightly better performance, far from 60 FPS, but certainly closer to it than what you're seeing on screen. Remember when these were a thing, when that progress bar would shoot up, the, sh the lines would shoot and you'd wait for it to install? And actually, the progress bar was always accurate. You could rely on it, not like nowadays where Windows time is a special time. And that's it. We have installed Quake 2 on this ancient PC. But the question is, how does it run? Hear that click? The click of the monitor changing its refresh rate. And there we go. A completely software driven render of Quake on an old PC. And as you can see, it holds up very well indeed. Now this was a PC circa late 90s, early 2000s, so it is pretty good. And this is running a Duron CPU, but you can see the game was heavily optimised towards CPU software driven rendering, and it worked superbly. This is an old machine, it looks amazing on a CRT, that's exactly how these games were designed to be played. But I remember when this game came out, and I actually had a 3D FX card, and I moved over to this game and I flicked it over to the hardware renderer, and then all the hoo-ha that we all knew and loved was, hang on, what's happened to the textures? And that's because it moved from this to texture filtering. So we had all that additional hardware benefits that GPUs, or they weren't really called GPUs, but the graphics cards were really giving us at that point. And software wasn't doing any of that. It was literally drawing naked pixels as naked as the day they were born. And that's exactly how CRTs are designed to see them. So once you move from this, if you move out and go into the options menu, we move to video, we can see that we have options here. A default OpenGL, 3DFX OpenGL, and a PowerVR OpenGL. Now we have quite a few resolution options. I'm gonna to move to possibly 800 by 600 and see how it gets on. We'll go to default because we could have issues. Let's keep the screen size pretty big. Full screen, yes. Text quality, yes. 8-bit textures, yes. Because 8-bit textures were really down to things like a lot of the TNT2 cards had limited bandwidth, 64-bit bandwidth. So some of the, the NVIDIA were pulling tricks back then even, <laughs> selling two cards with the same name, but actually one of them was 64-bit bandwidth and one was 128-bit bandwidth. So the bus speed was a bit of an issue back then, hence why you still had 8-bit textures as an option, which is quite, it lasted quite a long time in the PC world. There's that satisfying click as the monitor changes. 
Didn't hand didn't like that. Let's try 640 by 480. No, we are still software driven here. But again, it highlights some of the techniques in titles that, again, we've seen since that this day. Nothing's drastically changed. And I've said this on a lot of my old and older retrospective analysis and obviously my modern ones. Things like the cutback on the CPU calculations for animation, you can see the frame rate of the animation is half that of the actual refresh rate. So characters in the game move at 15, 30 FPS, sometimes lower. And that isn't even distance based, that's just across the board. So it can make the animation look stuttery even though the game can run at much higher frame rates. These are all cut back and sacrifice optimization techniques we've seen in modern titles even to this day. They will continue. There's lots of options. You've got CPU culling of the geometry to make sure that calculations of vertex are kept to a minimum. But when you move to something like Quake 2, which had a retrospective hardware um, accelerated version released, an API driver, it doesn't work here in my TNT2. This was a common problem back then. Uh, the, the OpenGL driver just doesn't work for the TNT2. It's the same issue with Half-Life. When you try and run the OpenGL driver, it just doesn't run. But when you run it in DirectX, it does run. And again, this is the version you've seen on screen earlier. Now, the hardware accelerated version does run actually quite well. Again, VSync is completely turned off. So performance is pretty good, but it does tear all the time, which can be quite distracting. On top of this though, other titles tried to push the boat out even more and you got to the point in 2001 where you had Mad Onion coming out, which everyone knows now as 3D Mark. They released their solution to testing your GPU and pushing forward with all the emerging techniques that were coming out around that time with the GeForce cards, the ATI new cards, and obviously the GeForce 3, the groundbreaking title that it was, pixel shaders, vertex shaders, and all of those areas in terms of programmable shader systems, that was the biggest leap forward. And it hasn't really drastically changed from then till now. We're still using very similar techniques, but moved to programmable shaders and allowing people to use the AIUs as they want in terms of compute or direct compute or calculations of 3Ds or even the solutions we've seen in the NVIDIA cards with the RTX and, and obviously the RTX cores to help out ray tracing. It's all about giving developers choices and you can see the trends back then to now as things slowly evolve, pick up, improve and again the 3D Mark test was one of those moments like you've got now with the uh, RTX cards where certain features in games you just can't turn on because they're not available and that's quite an exciting moment and I'm not saying that what's seeing now with RTX and ray tracing is the same level as what we saw back then with 3D acceleration pixel shaders but it is a huge shift forward and hopefully this video gives you a look back at what we used to enjoy back in the late 90s and early 2000s and if you like this or anything else that I've put together you know what you can do you can subscribe to the channel get my numbers up and share this with people and other videos so that I can improve my view rate and my impact on the market. Now I'll put a little link below to what you can choose for the next video. What's the most important area you want me to cover? Is it to go back to Windows 3.1, the older systems, pre-acceleration, completely CPU driven, back when Doom was just a twinkle in John Carmack's eye? Or do we want to look forward and move into the benchmark, which I've done quite a lot of already, of these various cards, including one very, very close to what was in the Dreamcast at the time. And some interesting results there, comparing that card to the Dreamcast itself. And just how impressive that console was and just where it was lacking in certain areas of PCs as well. But anyway, you can leave your thoughts and feedback below and you can chat with me on Twitter if you want to. But for now, I'm out. Stay cool, stay calm, stay retro. I'll see you on the next one.